and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Kanishka Gupta and let's have a look at the stories for the day. This is GE Vernova, helping generate and move the energy that will change the world. Welcome to a new era of energy. For hundreds of people who worked at Twitter as recently as Friday, the bitter reality will take a while to sink in. But for Elon Musk, it made perfect business sense. He had dropped hints on mass layoffs soon after taking over the San Francisco based company. But the planet's richest man is facing backlash for hastily expelling so many people. So, is Musk setting a new trend where owners can brush aside the HR rule book and write their own edicts? Let's find out. A week after his $44 billion acquisition of Twitter, Elon Musk kicked off mass layoffs at the social media giant on Friday. Sources told Business Standard that the majority of people at Twitter India have been laid off. Employees from segments like policy, communication and engineering and development have been affected. Media reports said Musk plans to cut around 3,700 jobs or about half the Twitter's global workforce in a bid to slash costs. Earlier. Musk had directed Twitter's teams to find up to $1 billion in annual infrastructure cost savings by slashing funding for servers and cloud services. In an email on Thursday night, Twitter told employees that they would be informed about their job status by Friday morning. If you are in an office or on your way to an office, please return home, Twitter said in the unsigned email. The company temporarily closed its offices and suspended all badge access. On Friday, Some employees tweeted their access to the company's IT system had been blocked and feared whether that suggested they had been laid off. The language in Twitter's communication was criticized for being brash for a subject that many said should have been treated with more sensitivity. The email said the staff cuts were designed to put Twitter on a healthy path. Many employees who were laid off took to Twitter to share messages of support with each other by tweeting blue heart emojis and salute emojis. Using the hashtags one team, and love where you work, employees let others know they had been laid off. This included multiple Twitter India employees. Some employees have already filed a class action lawsuit against the San Francisco headquartered company for conducting mass layoff without providing the required 60-day advance notice, allegedly in violation of US federal and California law. This is not the first time Musk has faced staff ire. In June, a group of employees at his rocket company SpaceX criticized Musk in an open letter and called on executives at the startup to make the company's work culture more inclusive. Elon's behavior in the public sphere is a frequent source of distraction and embarrassment for us, particularly in recent weeks, the letter read, without singling out any controversy in particular. Days later, SpaceX reportedly fired at least five employees who helped draft the letter. Musk has been known to take decisions unpopular with employees. On May 31st this year, he sent a similar email to employees at both SpaceX and Tesla declaring that remote work is no longer acceptable. He asked employees to return to the office or leave the companies, adding they are required to spend a minimum of 40 hours a week in the office. He said that manufacturing great and exciting products does not happen by phoning it in. At the time, major tech firms in Silicon Valley did not require workers to return to the office full-time amid resistance from some workers and a resurgence of coronavirus cases in California. Musk now reportedly wants to revoke employees' right to work remotely at Twitter. But how should one judge the world's richest man? Kamal Karanth, the co-founder of specialist staffing firm Exfino, tells more. I understand that the eye-rolling about the modus operandi uh, uh, is driven more by the owner's persona and not so much by the move itself, in a way. Uh, Whether they should have been... uh, you know, given more time, more grace, 
these are all things that we will question sitting here because we believe that uh, you know there is a certain template that we all think is the right thing to do but i think in america's people get fired in a single day in most companies you know uh, so i guess it's also culture of the country where i think people let, are let go on, on the same day uh, the more rules that i i put on myself the delay caused in executing my own vision uh, will hamper the organization in the longer run uh, he has his own set of fans uh, but besides that uh, i believe that there are different personas including some of the startup founders in india that we all take shots at but there seems to be people working there those companies are also you know coming up with you know breakthrough products so there are set of people who i think like this approach so i believe that uh, certain kind of talent may not like to go and work for twitter but i'm sure there are also certain kind of people who may want to work in the context of where twitter is today to make a breakthrough and some of us uh, you know are okay to let go some bad behavior because there is an upside of you know working with somebody like elon musk let's say if you uh, we want to assume that more people will behave like elon musk i'm sure they they you know, should behave like him after creating what he has created i think that would be a better benchmark than saying i'll behave like elon musk because now it's a template right but what twitter can become later Uh, because of what he did we we'll all forgive him if at all i think twitter takes off in a different way and he created a revenue model even by charging a lot of the actions taken by elon musk are in entirely new takeovers in the past have also been followed by layoffs the public nature of twitter the media glare surrounding it and musk's own celebrity have brought the developments at twitter in for a particularly detailed scrutiny however it is unlikely to set a new standard in how companies hire and fire their employees in so far as anyone replicating the particular methods employed by musk at twitter of missing 12 billion dollars from india china bilateral trade is engrossing as the ongoing developments at twitter china said that its trade with india touched 103 billion dollars in the first 9 months of 2022 but india says that it is 91 billion dollars so who is right Experts were baffled when trade data from India and China showed a mismatch of 12 billion dollars. China said its trade with India touched 103 billion dollars in the first 9 months of 2022, but India said that its bilateral trade with the Asian giant stood at 91 billion dollars. Yes, you heard that right. 12 billion dollars unaccounted. Data from China's General Administration of Customs showed that the country's exports to India stood at 89.99 billion dollars till September. According to India's figure, the imports from China were worth 79.16 billion dollars. This shows a gap of over 10 billion dollars. Similarly, a gap of 2 billion dollars was noted in the data on exports from India. India's data showed exports to China worth 12 billion dollars, while China's corresponding data showed a figure of 13.97 billion dollars. According to a financial daily, China pegged the trade deficit between the two countries at 75 0.67 billion dollars india says it was 67.17 billion dollars bringing the difference to over 8 billion dollars experts point out that in bilateral trade the export numbers for one country hardly ever match biswajit dhar economics professor at the jawaharlal nehru university delhi explains you know these trade figures reported from uh, you know the the two countries the two countries which are trading uh can can uh, can never never match the, the simple reason is that uh, when um, uh, exports are um, uh, usually uh, done on the uh, on the face value of the products uh, so whatever is the uh, the the value of the product 
our products that are being exported, which are reported uh, to the customs uh, uh, by the by the companies concerned, that is the value of exports. Now, trade, other costs, and uh, and insurance, all these are included in the value in the import value. So, uh, uh, exports are what we call the free on board, um, just the free phase value. And, and imports are uh, CIF uh, value. So, so there will be a discrepancy. However, the FOB CIF discrepancies cannot account for the kind of discrepancies that have surfaced in the recent trade data. Experts say that this gap is caused by systemic corruption, primarily the act of under-invoicing of shipments. Uh, traders on both sides, they are, not, they are actually not reporting uh, the true value of the imported and, and 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 exported products, and and this is this is what we call under invoicing, uh, or they actually they can they can report less or they can report more, yeah, uh, and 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 that all depends on how they want to uh, sort of siphon off funds uh, from 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 the country. However, Dr. Jayant Dasgupta, former Indian ambassador to the WTO, thinks that while under-invoicing can surely be a factor, it might not be enough to account for such a huge difference. Instead, he points to yet another possibility. Import data is collected on the basis of entry into Indian ports, whereas the export data is uh, collected on the basis of uh, exports that is uh, the products leaving the shores of China, for instance, in the case of China, India. So there would be some time gap. Uh, if you assume that the uh, average time taken is about three weeks for shipments to leave China and arrive in India and get uh, reflected in the customs import data, then, uh, you know, the Chinese data would be of a slightly earlier period. Whether it be a gap in calculating the imports and export data or systemic malpractice, what kind of regulatory measures can be taken to put a check on these? Dhar says the G20 should take initiative. The G20 should become more proactive on this. And I think, again, there's a message for the government of India. It's going to be taking the presidency of G20 very soon. I think this is an important, uh, uh, it should be an important item on the agenda of the, of an Indian presidency, they should they should take it take it up and then uh, uh, try and convince all the participants that this is an issue that needs to be sort of uh, given more attention and whatever is being done uh, already, uh, efforts will have to be you know sort of uh, 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 sort of uh, much more efforts have to be let me put it this way much more efforts have to be put in in order to uh, address this problem. Das Gupta disagrees though. I think uh, this is not the domain of G20 because this is something which is really dealt with by the World Customs Organizations about procedures, about uh, you know how things can be streamlined and data captured uh, in, uh, in a complete manner. So it is upon the customs authorities of the two sides to sit together and find out where uh, lies the difference in the data and then try to uh, you know reduce the difference and then uh, completely eliminate it at some point of time in future perhaps a more digital response can work let us listen to das gupta i think uh, moving to a system of uh, complete uh, automation that is data is captured correctly uh, uh, on uh, online and there is also a reconciliation suppose i get a let export data uh, let export order from the customs authorities in india for 100 pieces and i actually export only about 95 or 90 pieces then it should get reconciled at some because exports don't attract any revenue collection but that uh, could be captured Either way, a permanent solution to such a bilateral trade issue is needed so that data disparity does not arise in the future.
Moving on, financial markets displayed tremendous resilience and ended with steady gains last week even as global central bankers raised rates. In the week ahead, markets will focus on the last leg of Q2 results and macroeconomic data for further cues on direction. Here is the report. In the week gone by, equity markets displayed strong resilience even as global queues remained wobbly. The US Federal Reserve hiked interest rates by 75 basis points, taking the benchmark rates to 3.75 to 4 percent, the highest since January 2008. Fed Chairman Jerome Powell sounded hawkish on future rate trajectory and said that the central bank still has way to go before it wraps up its tightening campaign. A day later, Bank of England too raised benchmark rates by 75 basis points to 3 percent, highest in the last 30 years. The central bank warned the UK would face a very challenging two-year slump with unemployment nearly doubling by 2025. Yet the global dilemmas failed to dent domestic equities. Strong Q2 performance by select companies and renewed buying interest by foreign funds lent support to the markets. Eventually, among key benchmark indices, the S&P BSE Sensex 30 index gained 1.7% at 60,950. The NSC Nifty 50 topped the 18,000 mark for the first time since mid-September and ended 1.9% higher. The BSC Midcap and Small Cap indices also settled with solid gains of 2.4% and 1.5% respectively. Going into this holiday truncated week, traders and investors will focus on macroeconomic data apart from the quarterly earnings for further cues. That said, the markets will remain closed on Tuesday, November 8, on account of Guru Nanak Jayanti. At the global level, however, the US midterm polls scheduled for November 8 will be on investors' radar. Currently, we are in the middle of quarterly earnings season. And it is important to see how various companies have been faring under pretty weathered circumstances. There are also a number of macro announcements being made, such as the US CPI numbers and the India CPI numbers. And it will be interesting to see how inflation has been impacted by the various rate hikes. There's some pretty terrible headwinds out there and some pretty difficult decisions to be made. And that is why I prefer to look at the longer term viewpoint. India, I do believe, will have its day in the sun, with many pundits believing this to be our golden decade. Sectors that I like looking at are those in the China plus one and the minus China story. What do I mean by minus China? I mean China itself is reducing its capacity in various industries, such as chemicals, steel, and various other commodities. And this is because it's got overcapacity in a number of them. It's polluting its own lands to export. And plus, it has to upscale its businesses. And India, with a pretty dominant or pretty decent position in a number of in these industries, for instance, it's number two in the world for steel, number six in the world for chemicals, should hopefully be a beneficiary as it increases its market share as well as its margins. There are a number of other sectors that I like to look at, but uh, these are just a couple I'd like to highlight. The government will announce IIP and manufacturing production data for September 2022 on Friday. According to forecast by Trading Economics, an independent data analytical firm, IIP and manufacturing production data may see contraction of 2.3% and 2.0% after a 0.8% and 0.7% degrowth in the preceding month. On the earnings front, Q2 results season will enter its last leg this week, with as many as 1,468 companies scheduled to announce their September quarter results. Prominent among these are BPCL, Coal India, Paytm, Policy Bazaar, Lupin, Tata Motors, Ashok Leland, GNFC, Sale, Zomato, Hindalco, Mahindra & Mahindra, Z Entertainment, and Aurobindo Pharma. Action in the primary market shall continue this week, with Monday being the final day for the subscription of Bikaji Foods International and Global Health. Besides three more initial public offerings, Archin Chemicals Industries, Five Star Business Finance Limited, and Keynes Technology India will hit the markets this week 
to cumulatively raise around 4,280 crore rupees. Financial markets respond positively to free trade agreements. Australia recently said that the free trade agreement with the India has been tabled in its parliament and is likely to be passed soon. But what is a free trade agreement? Watch our next report to find out. Several experts believe that Britain's exit from the European Union in 2016 is one of the reasons for its ongoing economic crisis. Businesses in the UK lost unrestricted access to European markets, which resulted in huge losses. It also led to a drop in the pound's value and a rise in inflation. The European Union is a shining example of free trade. Its countries have made borders almost redundant when it comes to trade and the single currency euro has made trade easier. For quite some time now, India and the United Kingdom have been in intense free trade agreement negotiations. The agreement was supposed to be finalised by Diwali, but the deadline was missed due to some friction points, including services. With new Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, the talks are set to get a boost and Downing Street recently announced that Sunak is committed to achieving a balanced deal. But what exactly is a free trade agreement? It is a pact between two or more countries where the objective is to remove trade barriers of imports and exports and ensure hassle-free trade relations as far as possible. Under a free trade agreement, countries offer preferential trade terms, tariff concessions to each other. India has so far signed a total of 13 free trade agreements with its trading partners like Japan, South Korea, countries of ASEAN region, etc. India has signed three FTA agreements in the last five years. FTAs are also agreed between countries to boost their respective trade. For instance, under India-Japan agreement, India's exports to Japan have improved from $5.6 billion in 2011 to $6.1 billion in 2021. Free trade agreements could be bilateral or multilateral. For instance, India has signed an agreement called South Asian Free Trade Area with South Asian countries including Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, etc. The main objective behind India's free trade negotiations is diversification and expansion of export markets. Some of the other factors that India considers when going for free trade agreements are cheaper access to raw materials, attracting foreign investment, boosting competitiveness and other geopolitical reasons. In addition to free trade agreements, India has also signed six preferential trade agreements. The main difference between the both is that an FTA is comprehensive covering areas, while a PTA is limited to only trade in goods and seeks only a tariff elimination in terms of a margin of preference. Nation's trusted bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. Doctors Without Borders said last week that if implemented in current form, the India-United Kingdom free trade agreement is likely to hurt the global supply of generic medicines. That is all for today. For more news, views and analysis, please log on to business-standard.com. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.